The second issue I want to address tonight is I've just been absolutely inundated with questions over this issue of uh, Alistair Begg. And so I'm going to answer it once. Uh, the time to ask me questions like this or deep theological questions are not out in the foyer on Sunday morning. And so sometimes people come up and they ask these profound questions, and I say, that's a great question, but you can see there's a line of visitors, and half of our visitors who come, maybe you're tonight a visitor, but half of our visitors who come, more than half, are not believers. And so I don't want to answer your question about Hilasterion that someone asked me last week when I have four lost people who are standing there and God is speaking to their hearts. And so let me address this issue with Alistair Begg. It's an important issue. As many of you know, uh, he has spoken here on two occasions in our pulpit. He has spoken at our missions conference at a luncheon to hundreds of missionaries. And we have respected his ministry greatly. In recent days, um, he was, it came out of an event that took place nearly six months ago of counseling a grandmother that became part of a podcast that became national counsel by default of wondering whether she should attend her grandson or granddaughter. I don't know what it is. I've heard it both ways from his own mouth. She's a granddaughter. She's a grandson. Maybe she was a grandson and became a granddaughter about a transgender wedding. And his basic counsel was, well, if, if your grandson or granddaughter, whatever it is, I don't know what his biological sex was, but that's who he is, whatever you want to call a person. His argument was if they understand that you oppose this lifestyle, then you should go and be supportive, and not only go and be supportive, but bring a gift. Of course, that hit the blogosphere and the evangelical social medias, and, and so what are we to do? It's no mystery. A Christian should never attend something that God doesn't even call a marriage. It's abhorrent to attend a wedding that is really not even a marriage. I was on the phone this afternoon with a visitor, and I said, I'm glad you came to Community Bible Church. Just wanted to personally welcome you. And within 30 seconds, she said, well, I'm not coming back. I said, oh, I said, was something offensive? She said, yes, I don't agree with you. I said, what don't you agree on? She said, well, your view on homosexuality because you made a statement and then I went back and I watched some of your sermons and I don't agree with you. Now, she's a married woman. She's not homosexual. But she said, I think that people who are homosexual should have the same spiritual status as anyone else. And I said, well, remember, everything you believe, everything I believe is based on something. Just because you believe it does not make it true. And so I read to her, I said, let me just read to you what the scripture says. This is the apostle Paul, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor th thieves, nor the covetous, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. So I said, now Paul includes not just homosexuals, but those who are engaged in fornication, pornea, premarital sex, though the term can be used broader to refer to any kind of immoral sensuality. We get our word pornography from it. Moikea, adultery, extramarital sex. And I said, now that statement is either true or it's not. I said, so your argument is not really with me. It's with God's word. And then I took her over to Romans chapter one. I said, let me just read one other passage because I could hear the anger building. <laughs> for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the women of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons 
the due penalty of their error. So God calls this degrading passions. He calls it unnatural. He calls it in other places an abomination. So your argument ultimately is not with me. I said what you're basically saying is that the Bible is not true. I'm not saying that. I said, well, then you tell me how you would explain these passages. And so some would contend that, look, we need to be compassionate. We do. Anyone, as I told this visitor, anyone can come to Community Bible Church. Anyone is welcome. As long as they're not disruptive to the service or violent, anyone can come. But I said, to become a Christian, I don't care if it's premarital sex, extramarital sex, perverted sex, you must acknowledge your sin. If it's not sin, you don't need a savior. We're all sinners. And so when we think about a marriage, marriage is certainly a Christian institution, but it's more than a Christian institution. It's a human institution that God created for man. So someone might ask, well, could you go to a wedding where the two Hindu people or two Muslims are getting married? Yes. A man and a woman getting married, I could. Now, would I marry them? No. I only marry Christians, born-again Christians. I won't marry a believer to an unbeliever. Only two believers. You say, well, why wouldn't you marry two unbelievers? Well, because I would share the gospel with them. And if they didn't want to receive Christ, then I'd say, well, I'm not really in the business of just marrying people. I'm in the business of building Christian homes. And so all the counsel from here on in over the next six months is going to be based for believers. And so I really can't help you, but I hope you'll receive the Lord. But could I go? I've gone to weddings. Relatives who were lost. No problem doing it. It's a, it's a human institution that God has given man, though it certainly reflects his relationship with Israel in the Old Testament and certainly his relationship with the church. But when you go to a wedding of, say, two gay people, even if you have put your foot down and made it clear that you believe this is wrong, you are still nonetheless by your presence because among other things, what makes a wedding a wedding? It's a public affirmation before men and women that you are going to be married in one in the Lord, that a man is leaving his father and mother and cleaving to his wife and the two are going to become one. You know, we used to say years back, if there's anyone here who objects to this couple being married, stand now or forever hold your peace. If I were in that situation, I'd say, I object. What you're doing is evil. God calls it an abomination. It's not even a wedding. Now, the Supreme Court of the United States may call it a marriage, but the Supreme Judge of the universe says it's not. And so there are huge problems with that kind of support. You know, if you have an alcoholic friend, or a drunkard would be a better term. Alcoholism is not a disease, it's a sin. If it were a disease, then you wouldn't be responsible for it. Now, it diseases the body, and if you want to use the term in that way, okay, fine. But God calls it drunkenness. What would you do to help an alcoholic friend? You'd, you'd try to, one, get him to a place where he's, his source for alcohol is dried up. And hopefully you would lead him to Christ so that he could find new life in the Lord Jesus. What if a person's addicted to pornography? And again, it's not just an addiction, it's a sin. Well, you want to help them to make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. Romans 13, 14. I tell parents all the time, you got these little handheld computers. And most kids who are 14, 15, 16 years old do not have the spiritual steel in their spine to handle what's coming over the internet. I mean, adults who can't. So you try to help them. So what do you do with someone who's in a gay relationship? You tell them the truth. And if you've been here, I hit on a couple of uh, verses that those of you who've been in tune to these issues, you heard me mention, for instance, I mentioned one Sunday, uh, Galatians 3, 24, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. 
And so one of the functions of the law is to reveal sin. And whenever you lower the standard of the law, you're not helping people, you're hurting people, you're not showing compassion. Because the function of holding God's standard here brings conviction. When you lower the standard just by your presence in a gay wedding, it's just wrong. Well, you say the people are going to reject me. Yeah, there will be people. That lady was angry. I guarantee she'll never show up here again probably. I prayed for her. Sometimes before you can make people glad, you've got to make them mad. And may, maybe just a seed was planted in their heart. And I've had people over the years who've come and they said, I was so mad I got up and left. But I couldn't get out of my head what you said. Uh, that was the Spirit of God. And so maybe she'll come to faith. She went to one of the ABFs. I haven't told the ABF leader, but he may get some charter before the day is over. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. That the servant is not greater than his master. So you're going to have opposition. There's no way around it. And so uh, two days after it hit the fan, since we run Alistair Begg on our radio station, I went ahead and called uh, their national ministry. I know the, uh, the, her name is uh, Amy Castleberry, not Castleberry, like my son-in-law who's a pastor, but no T, Castleberry. He said, Amy, I'm really concerned. I said, what he said, nobody agrees with him. It's not like he has some minority voice. There's not a single Bible-believing pastor in the country who agrees with what he has said in the council he gave. None, except the progressives and the same-sex attraction pastors. They're the only ones who are behind him. Nobody. And I said, I want, you know, Alistair's a good man. He's had decades of good ministry. He's preached in my church twice. I don't want to drop him, but he's got to come to grips with this. So some more days went by, and so I, I wrote Alistair. I have his cell phone, and we've dialogued, and I wrote this. I'm going to read it to you. Alistair, Pastor Carl here, Community Bible Church in Beaufort. I spoke with Amy and told her with great sadness that unless the situation changes beginning a week from Monday, which will be this coming Monday, WAGP is going to drop Truth for Life, ending our 25-year relationship through a 100,000-watt radio station. Alistair, I know you've heard all the arguments against your advice, so I'm not going to repeat them. But for no other reason, consider the children. Let me explain. The transgender community has found a recruiting tool in the public school system. The homosexual community has never been able to directly recruit children in the schools. But now through this whole transgender movement, starting in kindergarten in most school districts across the nation, they begin to teach little children to question their gender and what pronouns they would like to use. By the way, this is something that I, I've not heard anybody else bring out. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm some smart person. But this is more than just a gay marriage. As wrong as that, this is a transgender marriage. And the homosexual community has never had a direct recruiting tool into the public school until they made gender an issue, where people could question what their gender is, that it could be different from what they were born with. And so to even go beyond a, a so-called gay, this is just another perversion of homosexuality, I don't understand, but a so-called transgender is, is to give credence to a platform that is beyond belief. This gives the homosexual community an avenue in which to recruit people into their lifestyle. This really saddens me more more than anything else. It's not just an invitation to a gay wedding, but to a transgender wedding, which accentuates the problem. In the name of love and compassion, we should run in the opposite direction to help those caught up in this sinful lifestyle as we would hold up God's word. As you know, the word of God serves as a tutor to lead people to faith in Christ. God calls us to protect these little children from the harm that... <laughs> that Jesus says warrants a millstone to be tied around people's necks. I hate to lose you, not just on our station, but for the kingdom work. 
I sense that you are consigning yourself to an early retirement in terms of influence. I do not know of a Christian leader in the nation who agrees with you. And none of them are fundamentalists except in the historical definition of the word. If you heard his counter sermon, he called people who oppose his view fundamentalists. And again, if you were here last Sunday, at least in one of the services, I define that term. The term fundamentalist is a superb term that came up in the early part of the 1900s when Protestant mainlines had begun to go liberal. And so within the main lines, Christians were asking, well, do we still cooperate with this Presbyterian church or that Baptist church? Or where do we draw the lines? And they said, well, there's some certain non-negotiables that are fundamental to the faith, like the deity of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, the substitutionary atonement, the uh, inerrancy of Scripture, the bodily resurrection, the bodily return. And they went through a series of non-negotiables. And so people who embraced those were called fundamentalists. A good term. The term fundamentalist between about 1910 and 1950 had the meaning that the term evangelical has today. Well, the term began to evolve and there were certain people within the so-called fundamentalist realm that maybe had a hateful spirit or dividing over issues that weren't issues of salvation. And then when you added to, add to that, you know, you've got the term used of certain Muslims and so forth. Most people repel the term today and I get it. So we have the term evangelical, but we're not even sure what that means anymore because people wear that label and it means a lot. So I said, and none of them are fundamentalists, contrary to what he said in his sermon, except in the historic definition of the word in affirming the essentials of the faith. We need you as a senior spokesman, he's 71, in the Christian community here in America where you have served faithfully for decades. I know it would take a lot to recant your position, but I believe God could use it in a great way. Otherwise, I have no doubt you are inviting a loss of impact for the kingdom and the power of the Spirit of God in your life. I don't expect you to reply, but if you want to speak with me, I won't clobber you. I'm happy to dialogue again. Here's my phone number. I haven't heard from him yet. Maybe we will over the weekend. But when you ask what happened to Alistair Begg Monday at 1030, you've just got my answer. If I don't do what's right, God will discipline me. And I'm going to do what's right. Now let me just say, if you ask someone 50 years ago, would you go to a a celebration of two homosexual people or two people who even say their sex has changed and go, are you kidding? Why are you asking that question? But you see, we've gotten used to perversion because we're a, a nation covered over in pornography and we've gotten used to what is evil. Now, I don't know what's driving this ship. I will pray for Alistair in the end here for taping purposes, we'll save it to the end uh, because of the people who will be viewing this as a separate taping course. So I hope that makes sense to you. Don't ask me anymore. I think I've said enough, all right? Let's bow in prayer. Father, we're thankful tonight that we can come and open your word. We know a day is coming when we will stand face to face with the Lord Jesus at his judgment bar, not to see if we're worthy of heaven, for your word has declared that we are saved by your grace and mercy. But you will hold us accountable for our service to the Lord Jesus. And so as we are studying your word in these days as to what really matters for eternity, we pray that you would continue to renew our minds and our thoughts and gear our thinking in conjunction with your word. We ask you for your help and your direction and for the Spirit's ministry tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, you have the handout in front of you. You're walking right into the middle of it. It will probably be about 60 pages by the time we're done. But we're talking about developing an eternal perspective. And so we first dialogued, dialogued over the shortness of life on earth. The scripture says our life is like a weaver's shuttle. If you've ever seen a weaver's shuttle, it moves fast. Uh, the scripture says it's like a flower that sprouts up and then fades. It's like your breath on a cold day that appears for a moment and then is gone. So compared to eternity, our lives are but a vapor. And yet, how we invest that vapor will determine how God will reward us through all of eternity. So we saw that we're to set our hope on God, not on the shortness of life. We saw that our life should reflect um, the fact that it is short and we're living in light of eternity. We walked through that. Uh, then we spent a little bit of time, if you remember, uh, discussing in light of that, the scripture admonishes us to teach us to number our days that we might present to the Lord a heart of wisdom. And so we need to live in humble dependence. That was Roman numeral number one. And then we launched into Roman numeral two that we need to think with an eternal outlook. And point A was that believers will not face a judgment for sin. And so you read a number of texts in the New Testament that the believer has passed out of judgment into life. That's a judgment for sin. And if you know the Lord, you'll never see him at the great white throne judgment. Uh, that's a done deal. He who believes in me is not judged. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But then point B in this section, Roman numeral two, is that believers will face a judgment for service. And so we began to explore some of the central passages concerning the believer's judgment. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to the Lord. Why? Because he says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And we saw that that word judgment seat is the word bema, and it has the article um, the judgment seat, or sometimes you'll hear Christians just call it the bema. And so the Bema seat was a platform that could be used negatively or positively. Uh, Jesus stood before the Bema of Pilate when Pilate rendered him guilty and sentenced him to crucifixion. We also saw that it was used positively in places like the Ismian Games, where a person's uh, life would, uh, their, their performance would be evaluated and they would be rewarded accordingly. And so the judgment seat of Christ is not a place of condemnation, it's a place of rewards. And so look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. It's under 39 on your handout tonight, but let me read it. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one, that is without exception, each one may be recompensed for his deeds. He's talking about our works, our service in the body, what you've done in this temple of the Holy Spirit that God's given you to get through this life in, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so that brings us to number 36 and where we're going to begin. Jesus will reveal, by the way, if you're new, there are some blanks to fill in because people are taking this uh, in our Institute of Biblical Studies. I spoke to a pastor yesterday. He's just thrilled with this course. He pastors a church in East Tennessee. He sells uh, medical equipment, very successful at what he does, uh, sells medical equipment uh, to hospitals and the like. Um, but he also pastors a church in East Tennessee because like many churches across the nation, they're dying. They're closing. 50,000 churches are projected to close. And so many churches are without pastors. He said, I never went to seminary, but I found search the scriptures, and I'm learning, and I'm growing, and I'm teaching people who don't know virtually anything. And so this course is thrilling to him, and I said, it's all designed. Teach it on a Wednesday night. Get him to fill in the blanks. All right, so we're doing that tonight. Jesus will reveal the character of our deeds as born-again believers, done as born-again believers, as good or bad, or you could render it as good or worthless. 
as a few other translations render it. One of the more detailed explanations of the judgment seat of Christ is found in 1 Corinthians 3, where the Apostle Paul compares our service to the Lord Jesus to that of the construction of a building. So Paul describes in the church like a building that we're helping to construct, all right? While the Apostle Paul addresses pastors, that's the context. He's dealing with pastors. But as we'll see, the principle applies across the board. While the Apostle Paul addresses pastors, this judgment applies to us all. And so he tells us that we must be careful how we serve because Christ's church is like a building and each one of our lives is like a building. And so wanting us to be wise in the building process, he states again, according to the grace of God given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. These are important terms and words. And so you wanna be able to think your way through this verse. And another, who's that? Another is building on it. And so each man is to be careful how he builds. Now, Paul, 40, established the church in Corinth during his second missionary journey, Acts 18. All right, you can read about that if you're not familiar with it. Someone was asking me this week, how do you keep track of all the books when they were written? Well, there's 13 Pauline epistles, and I've given you this before. It's been a while since I've taught Acts. It's very simple. One, two, three, four, two, one. <laughs> one, on the first missionary journey, he wrote one book. What book did he write? Galatians, right at the end. And of course, the Jerusalem Council takes place right after he finishes Galatians. Second missionary journey, he writes two books. First and Second Thessalonians, churches that he visits on that missionary journey. Third missionary journey, he writes three books. He writes Romans, and well, first, first and Second Corinthians, and then Romans. And then the fourth missionary journey, you say, I didn't know there were four missionary journeys. Well, there is a journey that Paul takes and that he's got his mind fixed on going to Rome. He's a Roman citizen. He wants to defend his right to appeal to Caesar. He has that right as a Roman citizen. He is going to actually be escorted to Rome. They're going to pay the toll all the way, and God is going to use him in a mighty way. So I'm getting off on a side plan here, but one, two, three, four, and then on that fourth missionary journey, writes four books, and then he writes two books, and then the final book. The last two that he writes is uh, in this, after, after the so-called journey to Rome, he writes First Timothy, and he writes Titus, and then his final book, of course, is Second Timothy. All right, that's a sidetrack, but in... Acts 18, you find him establishing the church there. And since he first brought the, them the gospel of God, it can be said that he laid a foundation in planting the church. So Paul started the church. No believers in Corinth when he gets there. It's raw pagans. So what does he do? Does that discourage him? No. He starts preaching Jesus. It's divine seed. It begins to take, and people are getting saved here and there. He laid the foundation through the preaching of the gospel. And so when Paul came to the city, Corinth, the foundation was laid through the proclamation of the gospel and telling them about Jesus. He was determined to preach only Christ and him crucified. And so people were saved. And again, you should expect when you're using the word of God to see people saved. Don't expect someone being saved from your testimony. Sometimes people think there's great power in your testimony. There's no power in your testimony. Your testimony might give you a platform, but the power is in the word of God. That's what God uses to bring about conversion. Many evangelical churches are gaining members without conversions. By changing the message, they're not preaching Christ and him crucified, and so they've changed the foundation. And again, this produces numbers, it produces growth, it's impressive, and people say, we want to be like them. And it's faulty growth. And that's what Paul has been arguing in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3. What kind of tools are you going to use as a pastor? Are you going to use the wisdom of the world, or are you going to use the Word of God? That's the, that's the parallel all the way through. 
And so yet the foundation, number 43, is the most important part of the building because it determines the size and the strength that any building will have. In my decades of ministry, I've seen churches try to build on a great order or a style of music or a special method of entertainment, but churches that are not built on God's word do not have lasting fruits. In the early chapters, Paul has been contrasting God's wisdom, 1 Corinthians 2, 7, which the world deems as foolishness. That's what they think. That lady today basically thought I was off my mind, out of my mind. You're nuts. I get it all the time. You know, you got to determine, are you going to please man or are you going to please God? And you have to decide that. Who are you trying to please? There will be people who will not like you, and they'll deem your so-called wisdom to be folly. And so the world deems God's wisdom as foolishness with the wisdom of this world, while the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. So God says just the opposite. Like many churches today, the Corinthians were trying to build their church by man's wisdom, by the wisdom of this world, when they should have been building with God's wisdom as found in the Bible. Someone's life and ministry may seem to be successful for a time, but if it is not founded on Christ, it will eventually collapse and disappear. Now, I recognize that this chapter is dealing primarily with pastors in the local church and the kind of building material they are using. Paul makes it very clear in this context that the church does not belong to a pastor or to a congregation, but that it is God's. That's what he is affirming in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. That's what Paul says to the Ephesian elders. It's the church of God which he purchased with Christ's blood. So while pastors are in view, the timeless principles apply to all believers because not only will pastors have to give an account, Hebrews 13, 7, right? Uh, Believers who lead the church have a stricter judgment, James also affirms, but every single believer will be evaluated. We just studied that last time, if you're here, from 2 Corinthians 5, 10, And then one of the other central passages would be Romans 14, 12. In Romans 14, Paul is addressing Christians at odds with one another as some flaunted their use of true freedoms in Christ, while others who were unduly strict and harsh condemned their freedoms. And so Paul reminds them in Romans 14, 12, so then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. You know that chapter, we teach it in the discovery class on the second handout under the realm of what we call gray areas or doubtful things. In other words, there are some things that God definitively says that are right. There are some things that God says definitively are wrong. But then there are those issues in between, people call them gray areas, that God hasn't spoken to. Well, they're not gray if you understand what the biblical principles are in exercising discernment. So Paul goes to an issue in the first century church concerning food. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Everything, because if you were Jewish, you grew up under the ceremonial law where there were certain foods, Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, that you could not eat. And so you didn't eat shellfish. You didn't eat pork. You wouldn't come to an oyster roast, a pig picking uh, oyster roast, all right? That would be non kosher food. Yet, under the new covenant, God declared all meats clean. Now, there are aspects of the Old Testament law, I covered this recently in a sermon about two months ago, if you were here, that are part of God's moral law. It's eternal, it's unchanging. But the ceremonial law that prefigured Christ or distinguished God's people as the people of God was temporary. And so certain ways you dressed, certain ways you cut your hair, certain foods that you could eat or not eat, because under the new covenant, the way the Spirit of God distinguishes us is through His indwelling presence. So you have this early church in Romans 14, where you have Jews and Gentiles who are combined. And the Gentile thinks, 
There's nothing wrong with having a bacon and egg sandwich. You may have problems with it, but God said, Jesus said, Mark 17, all foods are clean. That what defiles a man is not what is brought into his body and then is eliminated, but what really defiles a man is that which proceeds out of his heart. And so then you have these Jewish brothers who think, well, I don't know, I've been told my whole life. And so there are these principles. And so you got this little battle going on. And Paul talks about Christians who may have freedom to exercise that wisely so as not to create contention in the local assembly. Now, there are things today that people say are freedom issues, and they're not freedom issues at all. That's another sermon. But the point in all of that is, Look, each one of us is going to stand before God. You're going to give an account on how you deal with people in the local assembly. So keep that in mind. He's bringing them back to that future accounting that we'll all face. And so in number 52, the strict Christian found it easy to judge his brother, writing him off as an unspiritual meat-eating compromiser, while the free Christian found it easy to show contempt regarding his brother's uptight legalistic attitude. Now, people who are weak in conscience, when you come to the next chapter, Paul wants them to become strong so that they could actually eat non-kosher foods and be in a good standing before the Lord. But people who had that freedom were not to parade that freedom so as to cause people to stumble. When we first, for instance, went to the Ukraine, Nobody wore makeup, not in 1998. The only people who wore makeup typically were hookers and immoral women. Well, that began to change as the Ukraine and Eastern Europe became Christianized. But when we first began to bring women there, we said, look, you know, peel off the makeup. You know, I know if the barn needs painting, paint it, but, you know. (laughs) But right now, you know, just forget the makeup for a while. Because if you want to have a ministry in this country, you need to be all things to all men, and you don't need to get people to unduly stumble. And so you exercise your freedoms carefully. So 53, basically the Apostle Paul's answer is, stop worrying about your brother because we all have enough to answer, to, to, Je- to answer before Jesus. The reality is, is that each one of us will give an account of himself to God, so we should let God deal with our brother, as Paul reminds us in verse 11 here of 1 Corinthians 3.11. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. So remember, Paul started the church. He laid the foundation. Who is the Lord Jesus? The church is not built on a man. Peter is not the foundation. He's not the rock. Christ is the rock. Now, you can build that case out of the Latin Vulgate Bible, but it is impossible to build that case out of the Greek New Testament. For thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the Latin Bible, which the Catholics dictate as the authoritative translation, they say, you're Peter, the first pope, and upon you, Peter, I'll build the church. But in the Greek New Testament, it says, you are Petros, a stone, and upon this Petra, this bedrock referring to himself, I'll build my church. And when there's a play on words in the Greek New Testament, if you have the New American Standard, it will bring that out in the marginal notes. But even if you didn't know Greek, you could figure out from other passages that the foundation is Christ. No one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But other preachers whom he has mentioned in the first two chapters, they come along and they build on top of that foundation and other pastors. And he's just saying, be careful how you build. Use the right kind of materials. And so while it may look super to see a Joel Olstein with the largest church in America, he's using the wrong materials. 
He's not using the word of God in which to build that church. And forget a false teacher like Joel Olstein, who's not a believer. You can have a real Christian pastor who gets sucked up into these little techniques that are not faithful to what God says he is to do. Preach the word, whether it's popular or not, in season or out of season. 45 times in the New Testament, we are instructed to teach doctrine. That's not a little light sermon. It requires preparation, and it requires rightly dividing the word of truth. And so, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, notice the other category, wood, hay, straw. A Christian's life in service to the Lord Jesus is likened here to constructing a building with either high-quality materials or those that are substandard. It's one or the other. When a Christian begins to participate in the building of God's local church, some may use gold, silver, and precious stones, representing the kind of materials that could be used to build a magnificent temple. While other believers might use wood, hay, and stubble, the kind of materials that are cheap, temporary, combustible, and substandard products. He paints a stark contrast between these two kinds of building materials that God's future evaluation reveal will reveal when God tests the quality of each man's work. So what would you rather have, a dump truck full of wood, hay, and stubble or a handful of diamonds when tested with fire? There's a lot of preachers and a lot of Christians Because remember, he's speaking to preachers, but the principles apply across the board who are building and serving with the wrong materials and in the wrong way. And they will suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ, as we'll see. Each man's work, verse 13, will become evident for the day, what day? This day when we stand before Jesus at the Bema. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Gold, silver, and precious stones picture something permanent. Whereas wood, hay, and straw, something temporary. Yet he warns that our service for Christ will be tested with fire to test the quality of our work. So while quantity has its place, it's more than quantity, God is a quality control builder, right? All of us who have met Jesus in salvation have built on Christ. But some believers use good materials while others use bad materials. And the kind of material we use will decide the kind of reward we get. God is concerned that we build with quality and the day is coming when Jesus Christ will reward us for the quality of our service and not simply for the quantity of our service. Now you say, what would you rather have, a truckload of hay or a handful of diamonds? I'd rather have a handful of diamonds, but I'd also rather have a bucket full of diamonds. So, you know, there's a quality factor, but there's also a quantity factor. So God is concerned not just with what size building we build, but what quality or what sort, as the King James and the ESV render it, or what kind the net or the Young's literal render is, what kind of service we have given to the Lord Jesus. This parallels what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.10 when he tells us that all true, all true Christians in heaven will be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So you can see how these intertwine, right? You follow that? All right. When God will evaluate our service to determine if they are good or bad, interesting, the word bad here, phalos in Greek, is not the usual Greek adjective, bad, which would be kakos or porneros, which would define moral or ethical evil. This adjective, translated bad, typically carries the idea of something that is worthless. And so some translations render it worthless. 
It carries the idea of something that is worthless, like wood, hay, and straw mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3.12, where Paul, in that parallel passage, examines this same judgment. This judgment will determine what works are acceptable in pleasing to God and what works are worthless and have no eternal value. Now, contrary to what my Roman Catholic friends teach, these passages are not a biblical basis for purgatory. By the way, this is one of the texts they use. They use two principal passages, one from 2 Maccabees. Between the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and the first, Matthew, remember there's 400 years of silence. There are some books that were written that were not inspired by God, but they shed light on that 400 years of history. And so in the 1611 translation of the King James Bible, those intertestament books were contained. And the Catholics jumped on that and they said, you see, you really think they are inspired. That's why you put them in your 1611 Bible. And in the 1613, they removed it. But they put them there because it shed light on that 400 years of history in some very important history. One of the arguments that demonstrates the supernatural nature of the prophet Daniel is he looks down the corridors of time to this future time we call the Great Tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week of the Daniel 9 prophecy, but he also looks to a shorter range. Remember, what showed a man to be a prophet was not only the long-term prophecies that he gave, but the short-term prophecies that he gave. If I said I'm a prophet of God, let me tell you what's going to happen 10,000 years from now. You say, well, that's not very convincing. But if I gave you not only long-term prophecies, but short-term prophecies that came true, now that's a different issue. And that's what Daniel does. And some of the prophecies he gives, they're so precise Liberals write him off not as Daniel the prophet, but Daniel the historian. He gives all these prophecies in the first half of Daniel 11 that are fulfilled during that period of time. It's incredible. They say this is impossible. It is impossible if you don't believe in the supernatural. If you don't believe that there's a God in heaven who knows the future and that prophecy is history pre-written, it is impossible. And so the critics said Daniel was written in the second century A.D. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls shut them up. And it made it a total impossibility, so they don't know what to do. Well, they should fall on their face and worship the living God if they're smart. But men suppress truth. What number are we on? 67? Oh, yeah. So contrary, oh, yeah, so they use two passages. Second Maccabees, that deals with prayer for the dead. Well, why would you pray for dead people? Can you change a dead person's state? Not according to the Old Testament, not according to the New Testament. And by the way, the New Testament writers never quote the New Testament writers as authoritative. They never quote them as scripture. Someone say, well, the book of Jude quoted. No, they weren't. They were quoting a tradition, an oral tradition that happened centuries before that some of those intertestament books happened to acknowledge. But Jesus never says, let me tell you what 2 Maccabees says. They don't quote the intertestament books. And the Jewish people to this day never have believed any of the intertestament books to be inspired. And if you're not sure how we got our canon of Scripture, go to my course in Bibliology. Biblios, book, Bible, ology, the study of, the study of the Bible, and we go through how we got our canon of Scripture. Why do we have 66 books? Well, the New Testament passage that they use to defend the doctrine of purgatory, remember, they don't believe a man can know that he's saved unless the church has deemed the person to be a saint. It's called the sin of presumption. And so typically what happens to the average Roman Catholic is you die and you finish your incomplete works lifestyle in a place of purgatory, a place of suffering, where you are cleansed. And then once you finish that cleansing, you head on to heaven. And this is one of the passages they use. 
Is that what Paul is saying? Contrary to what my Roman Catholic friends teach, these passages are not a biblical basis for purgatory because it is the believer's works and not the believer himself who will be subjected to the flames. God will test the quality of every man's work. Of course, he'll go on to say, if any man's work is burned up, his work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. So the purpose of the bema or the judgment of the just is not to punish the believer for his sins, but to reward him for those works done for Jesus. Many believers in Jesus have never really thought about the implications that someday he is going to evaluate our service in the local church that we should be serving in and that he will test the quality of each man's work. By the way, that's the focus of the New Testament. I'm not against parachurch ministries. I got saved through one. I'm not against them. But the focus of the New Testament is not the parachurch. It is the local church. And that is where the people of God are to invest their lives and their time. Let's do one more page, I think. One of the most sobering thoughts that I can share with a believer is that in the future, each one of us will be judged for our service to Christ. Sadly, many Christians think that since they are saved and that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, it's Romans 8, 1, right? That they will not have to give any kind of an account for the way they've lived. I'm saved, no condemnation. I'm headed to heaven. Well, you are, but you're still going to give an account. They have falsely concluded that since God is going to take all his people to heaven, that each one of us will equally share the same blessings. But as we will study in this section, God will ask each of us to give an account for the way that we have prayed and worshiped and witnessed and given and served with our gifts and the way in which we have sacrificed for his kingdom and glory. And again, we're going to say it's not just what we do, but how we do it. So you could be over there serving with our little children and being thinking, oh, this is my turn to serve as a VIP, and I'm miserable. I can't wait till that service is over. And why isn't Dr. Brogy finished? And you can be a gripe, and you can have another person over there doing the same thing, filled with the Spirit, joyous that they have a chance to build into the life of children. Both did the same thing for the same hour, but in eternity, there'll be a difference at the judgment seat of Christ. But as we will study in this section, God will ask each one of us to give an account. 74, unfortunately today, Christians as a whole have seriously neglected or have willfully diluted the whole truth of our future examination. So on the one hand, it is critical that we understand when speaking of this judgment, we're not talking about some evangelical purgatory because we will never be condemned for sins Jesus bore as our substitute. Because there is no condemnation, and that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, we will stand before God without fear of rejection if we have trusted Christ as Lord. At the same time, God is interested in quality, and accountability without ever dismissing quantity. But clearly, quantity means nothing if the quality is lacking, which is why Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 2.5, and also if anyone competes, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Just as athletes in Paul's day had to play according to the rules, even so in God's Christian race, we must follow the rules too. And so we must know the rule book, the Bible, in order to know what constitutes eternal treasure. There are several pictures used in God's word to illustrate the principles of evaluation at the judgment of the just about the kind of service we do especially that of an athletic contest, as explained in, for instance, 1 Corinthians 9. We'll hold it right there. We'll pick it up here next time. All right, let's, let's bow in prayer, shall we? 
Now, our Father, I thank you for, I know we've just cracked the door on this and we're going to be able to examine in the weeks ahead all that you say about what really matters in life and we want to know that. We know that everything ultimately is important to you, even the kind of work that we do. Some women today cleaning their home and changing diapers and some dads involved in labor, some working behind a desk. It's all important. But help us to sort through how we do what we do and then what should we focus on on things that really matter. I want to thank you for those who actually fell to their knees and asked you for someone that they could bring. And if there's still someone, Father, some lost soul that you'd want to bring on Friday evening, I pray that you would bring those individuals. And I pray that those who are here who have not signed up, who could come and enjoy, that they would feel the freedom to do that. We want to pray for tomorrow night and Sunday night as we host our Meet the Pastor. I think of the many people that I spoke to today, some who know you, who need a church, and some who don't even know what it means to be saved. So we pray that you would draw people by your spirit and meet and minister to those needs. We pray for Todd Friel. Thank you for his willingness to come. We know unless you build a house, we labor in vain, that all of the efforts mean nothing unless the Spirit of God is behind it. And so we cry out to you in dependence that these individuals who have been invited, some who need to be reminded, that they would come and that the Spirit would begin a work that would bring them to salvation. I thank you for my next door neighbors and I pray that you would work and stir in their hearts that their lives would be changed. We pray for our youth ministries that will meet tomorrow night. We pray for Zach and Pastor Drew as they give leadership to those young men and women. We know we live in a day of wickedness where there is compromise everywhere. And so we pray and ask that you would help them to stand strong and to make the right decisions in the midst of a godless generation. You warned us that before your son returns that this world would become more like Noah's world and Lot's world. Father, it amazes me that we would even discuss going to a transgender wedding. We pray for Alistair. We thank you for the contribution to the kingdom that he has made over these decades. We know ultimately it is a local church issue, and so we pray and ask that his elders would have eyes to see that they would hold him accountable and that he would see that this is not an issue of conscience on his part, but this is an issue where he is wrong. He still has many good years, so we pray and ask that you would work these things out for your own honor and glory. We want to lift up Israel tonight as the tensions continue. We pray and ask that you would help those who are defending that nation to have success against the evil that has come upon them. We pray and ask that our government would be supportive we thank you, our Father, that you've promised that once they were planted in the world, land, they would never again be removed. And so we rejoice in that promise. Thank you that you will ultimately bring back the Prince of Peace who will rule and reign, and your ways will be lived out on this planet. Until that time, we ask that you would help us to occupy that we would care about people around us, that we would see them as you see them, headed for one kind of eternal destiny or another. Help us to love them with the love of Christ. When opportunity comes, that we would share Jesus with them. We know, our Father, that our minds are soiled by the world, and you are in the process of renewing them. And so we're asking you by the Spirit to take the truths that we've even examined tonight and to renew our minds and our thoughts. For Jesus' sake, we ask it in his name.